Garden of Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, right here on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word from the Lord. Thank you for being patient with us. Appreciate Mark and Micah for carrying on while I was getting down here. I was having a little trouble. Uh, I run a little late, not a little trouble. We had um, some good discussions after our program, our, our, after our class tonight. Here you go. That's fine. Had a uh, <clears throat> had a, some a visitor tonight, and we had some discussions, uh, Bible discussions. Unlike the uh, the folks on the videos that Mark and Michael were showing, you actually can ask us questions and have dialogue during our class. But um, uh, I was running just a little late getting down here, so I appreciate your patience. Here's our content information. If you want to reach us, two feet at the Boulevard is where we meet on Sundays. And Thursdays, 10 and 11 on Sundays, uh, 7 o'clock on Thursdays. And then, of course, we're from the Lord at 9 o'clock on Thursday nights. And uh, you can reach me at 276-340-2653 at word from the Lord at gmail.com. Content information for the folks in Martinsville, uh, uh, 823 Starling Avenue, 120 American Legion <clears throat> Boulevard. And you can uh, certainly find that you'll be welcome there if you want to study the Bible. I appreciate... Uh, uh, appreciate the brethren in, all, in these areas for uh, their, their stand for the truth, their love for the truth, and I know you'll be uh, uh, warmly welcome and you'll be a friend if you go and visit. You may be a stranger when you get there, but you'll be a friend when you leave. So hope that you will do that very thing. Tonight, <clears throat> I want to discuss something that's been in the news uh, very, very, I don't know, uh, all over the place. New York Times says, uh, in, uh, in shift, U.S. says Marriage Act blocks gay rights. And so the big headlines say, President Obama, in a striking legal political shift, has determined that the Defense of Marriage Act, the 1996 law that bars federal recognition of same-sex marriages, is unconstitutional and has directed the Justice Department to stop defending the law in court, the administration said Wednesday. People are all up in arms about this, upset because the president and the attorney general are no longer going to defend a law, a federal law that, that uh, uh, says that marriage is between one man and one woman. And everybody's up in arms because, well, that, they took an oath to defend the law, to defend the Constitution and defend the laws. And now they're just going to pass them over. And everybody's upset about that. I mean, you can read about it all in the newspaper. ABC News headline, President Obama instructs Justice Department to stop defending Defense of Marriage Act because Clinton signed law unconstitutional. How dare someone take upon themselves to call a law unconstitutional instead of going through the proper procedures of determining if it's constitutional or not. Everybody's all upset about it. It's all in the news, CBS News. Obama administration decision to defend, not to defend, the De Defense of Marriage Act will trigger heated political battle. And then you can even go to Facebook. Some of uh, my, uh, a lot of friends on Facebook are posting articles that, that are linked to the Defense of Marriage Act or other news articles that talk about the, uh, the choice or the decision not to defend the, uh, the law, the Defense of Marriage Act. And so my question is this. Why is it that so many people are getting upset because somebody is not enforcing a law called the Defense of Marriage Act? Now you say, well, James, I thought, I thought you'd be all up in arms about this too, all upset about it. Oh, yeah, I'm upset. But you know what? It's what I expect. You see, I expect man, I expect man to be fickle, and flip-flop and say one law is unconstitutional if it doesn't fit my agenda. I expect that from men. I expect that from men to disregard the laws of men. I expect that because I expect that men will do with men's laws what I know they do with God's law. See, God's law 
is really of no more importance to men than man's law is. If man will disregard man's law, then is it a, you know, is it surprising? Because if you go to God's law, they disregard it as well. See, we're talking about the defense of marriage. Who is really defending the act of marriage? That's really what the question ought to be. The question ought to be, who is really defending the act of marriage? You shouldn't be upset if Obama or Bush or whoever, Eric Holder, the Attorney General, you shouldn't be upset about that. You ought to expect it. Because when it comes down to uh, uh, defending the laws of God, people are unconcerned about it. People don't really care about the, the laws of, of God. So it shouldn't really surprise you. It shouldn't really surprise you that they would feel that way about, uh, about man's laws. Look at this. Let me just give you a for instance here. Here is Jerry Falwell, the late Jerry Falwell. Dr. Jerry Falwell. Here's what he says. Now, what is this continual adultery? So he says that you can't continually live in adultery. He says there is not a verse of Scripture that talks about perpetual adultery. Adultery is an act and a lifestyle. When a person is forgiven by the Lord and is under the blood, he or she is no longer an adulterer. Now stop for a minute. Look what he says. He says there is no such thing as continual adultery and then turns around and says adultery is a lifestyle. I thought a lifestyle is a continual thing, is it not? Isn't a lifestyle a continual uh, process? Someone says, well, I'm going to have a gay lifestyle, a homosexual lifestyle. Is that just a one-time thing or is that a process? Is that a continual thing? Somebody needs to show Jerry Falwell, somebody needs to show Jerry Falwell some verses in the Bible. Did you know that the Bible does talk about... Um, uh, uh, perpetual adultery? Notice this. I came in late, don't have my Bible program up. We'll do it the long, the longhand version. Everybody, let's get your finger exercises out. Let's just turn to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice this. Paul says, <clears throat> Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Fornication is the first thing he lists. Fornication is what you lived in. Fornication is what you walked in. Sounds to me, Jerry... Of course, Jerry knows this now. But it sounds to me like that is a continual or a perpetual uh, thing, is it not? Is it not perpetual or continual if you're living in, them, in these things or if you're walking in these things? Does it not sound like it's continual? Notice this. You walked in them. You lived in them. I say, Jerry, you need to go back and read the Bible. You need to go back and read the Scriptures. Here's what it says again. He says, although it's not God's ideal that second and third marriages occur, God's grace is always greater than all our sin. In other words, it doesn't really matter what God says about marriage and divorce. It doesn't really matter what God says on a marriage because God's grace is greater than all our sin. God's grace can handle it, he would say. Well, let's listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, but Jerry allows it. Should we continue in adultery? Jerry allows it, but God forbid it. Jerry Falwell is the man who said we have to rethink our position on marriage and divorce because all of our members are dealing with this. And so we have to understand that if we're going to keep our members, we've got to change our law. You see what I'm saying, friends? These people, like Jerry Falwell, they're not concerned about God's law. They're not defending the act of marriage. Why would it upset you if the president, the attorney general, or anybody else doesn't defend it? Why does it surprise you? If a man will look at God's law and say it's not really important, 
it shouldn't really surprise you that he'll do it to man's law. Look at this. You see, man seems to be focused more on uh, his law or his, uh, uh, yeah, his laws than he does God's laws. Notice this. In Matthew 15, Matthew 59 is one we always we look at and we say, well, yeah, in vain they worship me. But look at the context of Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 1, here come the Pharisees and the scribes and said to Jesus, why do thy d- disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And he said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? They didn't have any regard for God's laws. So it really shouldn't surprise you if they're going to break man's laws. Why is it then that we're so surprised? Who's really going to defend the act of marriage? Look at this. Is it Billy Graham? Why isn't anybody getting upset at Jerry Falwell? Why anybody getting upset with Billy Graham? Everybody's upset with President Obama and Eric Holder because they're not going to defend the Marriage Act. But these guys, like this, like Billy Graham, who's probably going to be responsible for sending more people to hell in our generation than anybody, we give him a pass because he's the late, he's he's great Jerry uh, Jerry Fowler. He's he's a Doctor Reverend Billy Graham. Why are we upset about these guys not defending the act of marriage? Here's what Billy Graham says. God never meant for people to be divorced. But if you are already divorced, ask God to forgive you, to cleanse you, to straighten you out, to make you a good husband to your present spouse if you have one. And if you don't have one, I guess you just go get one because you've already asked God to forgive you. It doesn't really matter. Now that's what Billy Graham said. Back in 1986. Just, uh, you know, God doesn't want you to be divorced, but hey, if you're already divorced, just say, Lord, forgive me. Go on about your business. See, they're not defending marriage. They're not defending the divine marriage law. Why are you going to be upset about a man who won't defend a man-made law pertaining to marriage? You ought to be getting upset at the greater problem. These guys like this. See? You ask yourself, when's the last time your preacher has preached on marriage and divorce and what God's law for marriage and divorce really is? See, I know what goes on in all these churches. They're concerned about numbers, and if they start teaching God's law on marriage and divorce, boy, you're going to call some people out pretty fast. Yeah, they gonna you gonna you gonna cut the herd down the flock down pretty quick. So what we're gonna do is we won't say anything about it. You can live with this person. You can have been married two or three times. You can shack up, and we won't say anything about it. See, this is who you ought to be getting mad at. This is how you ought to be getting upset with. This is a man. I'm gonna play you a clip of this man, Olin Hicks. He taught the same thing that Jerry Falwell taught. We brought him up back in 2005 to have a debate with one of our brethren. And here he is. This is what he says. Listen to his defense of the marriage act. Listen to what he says. This is what I find over here. Does, uh, Does that mean that if it happens seven times, even though it was wrong each time to put them away and wrong each time to remarry that they could still continue in each of those marriages. In other words, is there a limit on how many times you can repent? I have known people who had a series of uh, destroyed marriages because many times their self-image is so low they'll look in the wrong place for a mate the next time. Marry someone that's just not a a suitable mate and they end up being uh, divorced again. I know that happens. The number of times that happens is not an issue. They asked Jesus that. How many times? Until seven times? What did Jesus say? Until 70 times seven. The grace of God is limitless. The number of times that happens is not an issue. The number of times that happens is not an issue. The number of times that happens is not an issue. So in other words, that's what Jerry Falwell says. Hey, God's grace is big enough to cover us all. You just pray for forgiveness and, hey, knock yourself out. You can have several hundred women. You can marry, divorce, don't like her, burn her, she burns her toes, she doesn't clean the house, whatever, put her away, get another one. 
That's Jerry Falwell's position. That's Olin Hicks' position. Who's really defending the act of marriage? See? I'm not mad at Obama. I'm not mad at Eric Holder. I expect men to break man-made laws because I know how men treat God's laws. These guys are the ones you ought to be upset about. These ought to be the ones that we have a great outcrying over. How come you're not defending the act of marriage as God ordained it? See, that's what you ought to be looking at. You say, well, James, well, what is God's law on marriage? Let's just look at it. Marriage is a covenant that God has organized, and he puts it between a man and a woman, an eligible man and an eligible woman. Now, the Defense of Marriage Act does not say what kind of man or kind of woman can get married. It just says one man and one woman. That means one man and one woman at a time. But you know all these guys, Newt Gingrich, he'd been married, I don't know how many times, two or three times. Even Ronald Reagan married at least twice. See? All of these guys have been married several times, and people say, well, as long as he had one at a time, you know, let's, you know, Everything in moderation. Is that really what we're talking about? Is that really defending marriage? Is that really the Defense of Marriage Act? Or is this the Defense of Marriage Act? Showing you what God wants and expects from marriage and then, and then insisting that you adhere to it. See, marriage is a covenant between an eligible man and an eligible woman who are joined by God. Now, notice this. In Malachi 2.14, here is, here is an Old Testament principle to show how God views marriage. What yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is, uh, yet is she the, co uh, the, the companion of, and the wife of thy covenant. One man and one woman that God has joined together, that God has been witness to. See, God is involved in the marriages that he puts together. Matthew 9, 19, verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now let me show you something, friends. Here is something that we need to understand God's law on marriage. God's law on marriage is this. Matthew 19 and verse 4. Have you not read, Jesus said, have you not read, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That's God's law on marriage. The only exception, the only exception is in verse 9. See? The only exception is in verse 9. He said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, it said to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now, that's defending the act of marriage when I tell you that. See, the act of marriage law just says one man and one woman at a time. It doesn't go far enough, really. It, it doesn't really defend the act of marriage as God has ordained it, and God's the originator of it. God's the originator of it. He gets to make the rules. Now, are you really, are you really getting mad because these guys don't defend the act of marriage law, or are you getting mad at the right people, the preachers who won't preach it, the teachers who won't teach it, the bishops, the rabbis, the the bishops and whoever who won't tell you what God really says on the matter because they don't want to upset you. Notice this. The only way that you are going to put asunder what God has joined together is by two courses. One, and this is what the lady called last week, she called about. Here's how you're going to do it. In, my, in Romans 7, verses 2 and 3, the woman which hath an husband, is bound to the, by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, 
she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Now, Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham would say, oh, she's only going to call an adulteress at one point. Because once she asks for forgiveness, she's not called an adulteress. That's not what Paul says. Paul says she's married to another man while her husband's still living. She's going to be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no an adulteress, though she be married to another man. Death is what separates the bond that God puts together between an eligible man and an eligible woman. Two young people get married. God binds them together. Never been married before, God binds them together. And the only way that they are going to be separated is either by death or in the event that one of them commits fornication and is put away by the other one. That's, that's the only way you get out of that bond. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. But God can put it asunder. God tells you the exception. He tells you what will dissolve the super glue of marriage. Notice this. He says, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever...